everyone, this is Austin from Marvelous Videos, and today we have Top 11 Scariest Monster Movies of 2021. Screams, bloody scenes, and suspenseful music are all the ingredients for a thrilling, tormenting flick. Some people love the adrenaline rush they get from the unexpected killer slicing his victim's head off its body. However, we are all used to seeing the usual ghosts or serial killers in their ever so common outfits. A long trench coat or mask that disguise a mysterious figure behind it all. Michael Myers and such comes to mind. Humans have a crazy imagination, and it gets even better when that imagination is put to the test by gnarly, disgusting, nasty, and horrific creatures that spearhead your favorite horror movies. The feeling of seeing these unrealistic creatures brought to life by talented directors is an unmatched one, as they aren't limited to the powers that a mere human villain holds. These creatures can be made to be literally anything out of their wildest nightmares, and that's what makes them super interesting. Iconic movies like Alien vs Predator, A Quiet Place, The Babadook, Jeepers Creepers are all Exhibit A examples of the same. Today, we'll be having a look into some of the creepiest and horrifying creature-based horror movies of the year. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Venom 2 – Let There Be Carnage This movie was among the most hyped names to come out this year, with producers even slating an early release owing to the success of Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. Undoubtedly, we bought the hype too. The movie picks up from where the first installment ended, with Eddie Brock, played by Tom Hardy, and Venom still reeling from a breakup with Anne, Michelle Williams, and is trying to get his life back together. In the process, he gets acquainted with Cletus Cassidy, played by Woody Harrelson, a twisted serial killer who is about to be executed for his crimes. Cassidy, too, is dead set on rescuing the love of his life, Francis Barrison, aka Shriek, played by Naomi Harris, from the Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Deviant. What this results in is a totally dull chaos, with Shriek's ability to produce screams that hinder her fiancé, Cassidy, who later on bonds with the symbiote to become Carnage. A noteworthy mention is that the cast of this movie is exceptional as per Hollywood standards and their acting prowess is undeniably phenomenal. Owing to that, the movie was portrayed beautifully by the said cast. The plotline is fairly straightforward and doesn't waste time in getting into the thick of it all. The surprising addition of two chickens named Sonny and Cher Venom's closest non-human friends was also wholesome to see. There were multiple engaging moments in the movie that would catch the attention of any Marvel comic fanatic, and also your average audience. The action scenes, Cassidy's backstory, and the CGI were pulled off in a unique manner. The background score and music used in the film was also decent, oftentimes adding much more depth to an already powerful set of scenes. The use of these tools elevated the movie experience to much higher levels too. Another talking point is that the movie didn't waste time on getting the viewers accustomed to the vibe that was being portrayed, and was fearless in handling two of the most well-known characters in the MCU, and executed it delightfully to say the least. There were moments that elicited laughter and humor every now and then, but it also was used in an unclear manner and was over the top at times. Spoiler alert, the mid credit scene was the cherry on top of this one and a half hour joyride of a movie. It ended with a cliffhanger by intertwining the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man from where he left off at Far From Home, and opens up multiple exciting prospects for the future of this franchise. It can only go upwards from here, and here's hoping that the directors and producers work on bringing another intense, thrilling, and enjoyable installment out sooner or later. And this movie is definitely a must-watch. <coughs> Quiet Place Part 2 When the first part of this movie came out in 2018, no one expected John Krasinski to pull off something like this, especially for a movie that had barely any dialogues or even much human sounds. Because that's what this movie is about. Horrifying, alienistic creatures that have better hearing than most humans, that look to hunt down the human race and a family's attempt to outlive the torture. Lee Abbott, played by John Krasinski, 
ends up making a heroic sacrifice for the sake of his family at the end of the first movie. And the sequel continues with Evelyn, Lee's wife, and also John Krasinski's wife in real life, Emily Blunt, trying to look for more people to establish a safe haven in these trying times. Along the way, she comes across a raggedy man, Emmett, played by Killian Murphy, a family friend of the Abbots who initially appears to be hostile but later on teams up with Evelyn and her kids. While the first movie focused on sacrifice and compromise, this sequel is based on the strength that comes with uniting with others, fighting against the same cause. This movie doesn't fear to venture into a more dialogue-oriented journey and also doesn't instill all the rules of making noises as sternly as it did in the first movie. There are decent jump scares, but nothing that is out of the ordinary, as it is evident that Krasinski tries to play it safe for the most part of this film. However, he does the occasional radical twist by putting every single character in dangerously uncomfortable situations, including the baby. But nonetheless, they find a way out, as is the cliché. The storytelling is handled impeccably and keeps you hooked throughout the duration of this film. Evelyn is put straight to the test being the matriarch of the family now. She was a badass in the first film and she continues to be one in this too. The other actors and actresses also play their due part magnificently. However, the villains in this movie, the alien creatures that fall from the sky, don't seem to have had any development or any sort of backstory to them. Which is the only drawback, if you consider it even, that is. All in all, for a movie that explores the intricacies of human interactions in such a tense situation, Quiet Place has done justice to it beautifully. And here's hoping that Part 3 does something greater to help give the aggressive human-eating monsters a voice of their own as well. Pun intended. Until then, make sure you watch this well-made thriller flick. Godzilla vs. Kong Evidently, as seen on paper, this sounds like a colossal matchup and rightfully so. Godzilla vs. Kong is an amazing action flick that thoroughly caters to the audience's needs. The movie gains traction when the famous Titan Godzilla breaks out of an apex facility at Pensacola, Florida. And Madison, played by Millie Bobby Brown, rounds up her gang of conspiracy theorist friends to crack down on Apex's sinister intentions. As they consider Godzilla to be a creature with a heart as large as itself, and that is capable of emotional comprehension, Apex assembles a team that then travels to the hollow earth where Kong's kind once ruled. And from there, things take a tumultuous ride. Kong's and Godzilla's species have been at war since the beginning of time, and this movie piggybacks on it to further introduce a villain which is the Mecha Godzilla, controlled by Ren Serizawa, played by Shun Oguri. And it's a mix of mechanical and conscious prowess. Story-wise, the movie is pretty straightforward with it all and doesn't seem to drag it out unnecessarily at all. And that is evidently seen in the movie via the use of glorious and breathtaking CGI sequences which additionally pull the weights for this flick as a whole. It also definitely does its job in instilling the legacy and greatness of the two titans. Their sheer size and formidable nature is enough to bring us down in all. The film's premise allows for the development of relationships between all parties. Like Ripley, Hicks, and Newt in Aliens, the childless Nathan Lind, played by Alexander Skarsgård, the surrogate parent Aline Andrews, played by Rebecca Hall, and the orphan Gia grow to trust and work together until they formed a makeshift nuclear family. It's impossible to not give huge credit to the performers. However, Kaylee Hoddle stands out in her role compared to the rest and portrays a nice impression as Gia, who connects with Kong through sign language. Everything else revolves around conflict, and the majority of the time, the viewers are treated to mighty entities fighting for establishing their supremacy. Even when the combat continues to get intense afterwards, it takes place in a world where the worst has already occurred. There isn't a single thing remaining. This adds to the depth of the whole scene and plot, making it a thoroughly enjoyable time. Although at a glance, it may seem like either Kong or Godzilla would be the villains, the real culprit is a wealthy businessman. Walter Simmons, played by Damien Bashir, who aggressively wants to eradicate every other ecosystem besides mankind. Or is he really in the wrong? That's a debate for another time. But one thing is settled, and that is this movie should definitely be in your watch list without a shadow of a doubt. What is that? The 
Devil Below. A gang of scientists and adventurers investigates an urban myth about an abandoned coal mine in Appalachia and discovers a danger far greater than they had anticipated. If this summary sounds cliché to you, don't judge it before you actually try it out. Because The Devil Below is a completely nourishing horror movie that does its job in the most justified sense. It begins in a very common theme that we are all used to seeing. All of your typical character types constitute the adventure group. Ariane, played by Alicia Sands, is a fierce explorer hired to find the mine's location which was erased from maps following a series of fires that released harmful toxic gases. A crew of scientists, commanded by brash British explorer Darren, played by Aidan Canto, joins her. Given the mysterious nature of the mine's legends, it's no surprise that one of the gang members, Sean, played by Shinaza Uche, is a superstitious type and the only one who feels that something dangerous may be lurking below. However, there is much to say about the characters considering how unique they are. An attempt is made to give them reason, and it's done through phenomenal lines of dialogue, and their backstories are handled perfectly without prolonging anything. The conversation that happens in the beginning is very relevant to the rest of the movie as well. It's an explanatory scene, and it's much better than the other half-assed attempts at character development we see in other cliché horror movies. The movie does a good job in fleshing out the characters and their dynamics, and it is seen when we find ourselves mulling over the deaths of the same characters. We're expecting a standard survival horror where we watch as the group is taken down one by one. However, that is not the case because the majority of the movie doesn't try to stick to a linear way of storytelling. It is smartly sprinkled with emotional sequences and thrilling atmospheric buildup that we often forget this is even a horror movie because it gives us so much more than just jump scares. So, The Devil Below isn't your average horror flick. While the creature's presence isn't fully explained, it allows for a dramatic shift in tone, which drastically speeds up the pace. Once the creature is unveiled, the film abandons its stale horror components in favor of action which adds a lot of hype and tension. The actors are also giving it their all with the script given to them, in the same way that Alicia Vikander's Lara Croft in Tomb Raider 2018 seeks to add both hardness and vulnerability to her overall stoic character. Sans' lead performance as Ariane is reminiscent of the same, so definitely when all is put together, The Devil Below is a great example in its attempt. Tomorrow War Chris Pratt leveraged all of his star power and recognition from the Jurassic World and Guardians of the Galaxy franchises to make The Tomorrow War, an interesting and engaging Amazon Prime exclusive sci-fi thriller. In The Tomorrow War, the world is startled when a group of time travelers arrive to deliver an urgent message. Mankind is waging a global war against a lethal extraterrestrial species 30 years in the future. Soldiers and citizens from the present must be transferred to the future and join the struggle if they are to survive. Dan Forrester, a high school teacher and family man, is one of many who has been recruited, played by Chris Pratt. Dan links up with a bright scientist, played by Ivan Strahovski, and his estranged father, J.K. Simmons in a futile attempt to rewrite the fate of the world for his young daughter. A touch of time travel, a swarm of ruthless alien invaders, a ragged band teaming together to defeat them, some unsettled father-son issues, and a few oddball sidekicks to give comedic relief. Director Chris McKay knits together several familiar yet fascinating components in a very inspired approach. Whether they're prepared or not, they'll be met with an army of albino creatures known as White Spikes when they arrive. They scurry and screech, strangle and cut with tentacles, and utter a rhythmic roar akin to the one heard in Predator. They also appear to be refreshingly new, both individually and collectively. Not only do they move in an unsettling manner, but the enormous action scenes are also edited in an intense way. Pratt, amongst all of this futuristic mayhem, actively summons the theatrical chops he is gifted with. As the cocky Peter Quill, he was already a hugely charismatic character speeding around the Marvel Cinematic Universe, while as the brave Owen Grady, he can be a compelling action hero dealing with dinosaurs. As the voice of cheery Emmett Burkowski in the Lego movie, he's an irresistible charmer. Pratt is now also known for playing the role of a suburban dad trying to save his family and all of humanity side by side to perfection. 
The movie ultimately succumbs to its alien influences in the final half hour with ear splitting shrieks and blood and yellow green fluid squishing and spewing everywhere. Anyhow, no one really knows what the future holds for us, but one thing is for sure, this movie must be seen in the near future by everyone. No one gets out alive. The best horror films play on universal phobias such as swimming in deep water, showering in a shady motel, or receiving a mysterious phone call. The most terrifying films, however, delve into a deeper anxiety. The fear of the unknown. No One Gets Out Alive was Netflix's first Halloween release, a horror film that follows young Amber, played by Christina Rodlow, an undocumented immigrant as she struggles to start life anew while juggling her bad job and shady landlord. The film should, in theory, click. It has all the makings of a superb horror flick, a terrific young actress putting her life and soul into the lead role, writing and producing partners like Andy Serkis, and a focus on illegal immigration, a contentious issue in today's politically polarized world, should have all added up to something exceptional. With all this in the mix, director Santiago Mangini's approach portrays a masterful drive to get the plot underway. The film wonderfully breaks beyond its status quo after two distinct prologues, one establishing Amber's background and the other showing the house she's about to occupy. Amber is tormented by the death of her ill mother in a reoccurring hospital scenario in the film. Then there's the hardship of navigating a sweatshop while other immigrants take advantage of her inexperience. This is before we even get to the lodging house's shady owners who target vulnerable immigrant women like Amber. The brothers Red, played by Mark Menchaca, Becker, played by David Figlioli, and The House have a gruesome past, reminiscent of films like The Living Idol and The Mummy. At the film's pinnacle moment, a creature emerges from a foreboding box with swole, muscly arms for legs, a face hidden behind a mask, a thick amphibian-like body, and skinnier arms with human-like hands and a mouthful of teeth right at its bottom. This perplexing creature was an interesting and original innovation for many viewers, and completely enhanced the feel of the movie from whatever it had built so far. Sluggish spooks can be agonizing in stories like this, but in No One Gets Out Alive, that is not the case at all. Amber is scared of the voices she hears in her chamber, but she is also terrified of not being able to obtain forged papers that prove her citizenship. All in all, this is a very compelling film that has to be seen to experience its beauty. Demonic. Demonic has the feel of a movie made by someone who wasn't afraid to venture into this genre and add their own spin to it, using their own ideas and limits. Everything in this film, from the direction to the screenplay to the acting, is up to the mark. Carly, played by Carly Pope, is called by an old friend named Martin after a creepy dream involving her mother, Angela, played by Natalie Bolt, overshadows the film, Chris William Martin. Angela and Carly have been separated for years, with the daughter abandoning her mother following a series of violent, homicidal acts that cannot be forgiven. Angela is said to be in a coma in a hospital, according to Martin. Angela investigates and learns that two men, Michael J. Rogers and Terry Chen, are interested in Angela and Carly. They've devised a method for allowing anyone to access the dreamscapes of coma patients, and they want Carly to use it to speak to her mother. It's a strangely drawn motion capture style that strips scenes of humanity while accentuating a chilly alienating effect that also affects live action sequences. Demonic is a uniquely passive film for the filmmaker who has previously handled projects that have been more on the nose and strong, in part because Miss Pope has been portrayed in an interesting manner. That it's never apparent what mood she's supposed to be conveying, which keeps the audience on their toes at all times, making things unpredictable. Demonic is a a notable supernatural story with commendable dialogue and remarkable execution, involving everything from individuals swiftly researching information on the internet to gathering clues from their hallucinations to a pretty intriguing looking raven-based creature. Arguably, all of these parts compared to the major disclosure regarding the dreamscape scientist 
which is given little attention or explanation following their genuine goals. By the time Carly returns to the simulation with all of the knowledge for one more contact with her mother, Demonic has built up all of its uniqueness and technological revolutionary appeal. It's the movie Neil Blomkamp always wanted to make. And just after 30 minutes, he settles for a classic possession plot with interesting cutaway gags like dreams inside dreams to create an estranged sense of fear. And hence, Demonic deserves a spot on this list. Candyman. Candyman is set in Chicago, the same place where Bernard Rose's original 1992 version of Candyman began the tale by examining the link between folklore, urban myths, and anti-black brutality. Those themes haven't subsided since Rose's movie was released. In fact, they've just gotten stronger. The current version, on the other hand, muddles them with shallow social criticism and even dull horror pleasures. After the prologue, Nia DaCosta's Candyman switches to the current day, where acclaimed visual artist Anthony McCoy, played by Yahia Abdul-Mateen II, has a chemistry-free relationship with artistic director Brianna, played by Tiana Paris. Anthony has been stuck in a creative slump lately. His prior series of works, which featured black men with nooses hung around their necks and exposed chest, has long since been forgotten. However, Brianna's brother, played by Nathan Stewart Jarrett, tells Anthony about the Candyman tale over a campfire, summarizing the events of the 1992 film. Bodies in her wake and then... Though audiences who haven't seen the 1992 picture will most likely need this recap, this sequel covers the events of the first film three times, leaving its 90 minute runtime properly distributed. It pays homage to the predecessor while remaining true to its own vision and plot. Virginia Madsen and Vanessa Williams, both in their original roles, make brief appearances, but not on screen. And the discovery demonstrates how effectively the story is put together. The remainder of the cast is excellent, with Abdul Mateen shining out in a challenging role. In a short length of time, the performers also persuade us of their relationship. The film also explores the obsessive sacrifices artists make for their craft as well as bodily horror. After being stung by a bee, Anthony gets a rash on his hand which causes his skin to itch and peel over time. The degradation of his physique coincides with his surge of neurotic inventiveness. The actual makeup work is incredibly powerful and frightening. Nia DaCosta uses a mix of black comedy, deception, and smart framing to create the death scenes, fully admitting that what you don't really see can be a lot worse than what you do see. One well-staged murder scenario is shown in a wide angle while the camera pulls back, giving us a view of someone fleeing just as the slaughter is taking place. All in all, we're in for a wonderful, stimulating evening at the movies. <laughs> Blood Red Sky the Netflix film, which is mostly in German, is equal amounts hostage suspense, family bonding drama, and horror film. The lady referred to as Mom in the subtitle serves as a prior warning. She appears sick and uneasy. When terrorists seize the plane carrying them from Germany to the United States, she never lets her smart son Elias out of her view and clings to him for dear life. On board is a secret weapon that challenges not just the hijackers, but also our cognitive biases and concepts of evil and ugliness. Without giving anything away, the movie has to be seen to be experienced. Suffice it to say that director Peter Thorworth creates a nail-biting gore fest that splatters practically every nook of the plane by the end of the movie. In Blood Red Sky, this brilliant concept is handled in a breathtakingly ordinary manner. Blood Red Sky only bursts to life in gory spurts once Nadia becomes full vampire. It never loses its spark or sense of tension, even as if it may seem less logical at some parts. It's easy to feel invested in all the story, in part because the POV is primarily that of Elias who is astonished by the craziness going on around him and is most concerned about his mother's destiny. One of the most notable points is that the direction of the movie is perfectly balanced which casts the apt cue for the excitement to take over. The plane fight sequences all blur together in aesthetic and substance, making it increasingly intense and thrilling to experience, all the while keeping the tension building. Even if it receives too much attention, Horvath's framing of the relationship between Nadia and Elias is effective and is fully worthy of all the attention it garners. This is truly a story of a woman trying to protect her son, in the extent to which parents would go not just to keep their children safe, but also to keep their hideous side disguised from their children. 
It's an absolute pleasure to see that such a great subject was dealt with in a very relatable manner on a cinematic journey that was absolutely worth taking. <laughs> Chaos Walking 2557 is the year. A community of male-only space settlers reside on a remote planet known as New World, where they are plagued by the noise a bizarre whirling cloud that shows each man's deepest feelings. Todd, played by Tom Holland, must defend Viola, played by Daisy Ridley, from terrible powers beyond his power after she crash lands on the planet. Eventually, we are found to be in the realm of a sci-fi story like E.T. or Starman with a telepathically attached duo, one of whom is more advanced than the other. The sci-fi aspects cohabit with a survivalist film element as well as parts of a classic Hollywood western about the politics of a society in a conquered land. Todd's essentially sexless, pre-adolescent way of interacting with women, and Ridley's super capable big sisterly vibes, also her energy in the Star Wars movies, guarantee that any attraction between them is repressed or diverted. It's noteworthy how Chaos Walking deals with the backstory of the indigenous species of humanoids who were driven into captivity by humans and allegedly cursed the remaining humans with audible slash visible thoughts as if condemning them for their sins. There's a lot of detail that goes overlooked in the rush to get Viola and Todd to finish their mission. There's also a not so subtle remark on how civilizations traditionally conceive masculinity and femininity. Males, for better or worse, are very simple to read, whereas women hide secrets and have ancient knowledge that can heal the men. We don't get much more than a few fragments of any of this, to be honest. The film is under two hours long and attempts to cover as much territory as a season of a television program while pacing itself like a trailer. When it takes a breather, as in a scene in which one character reads aloud to another, you get the essence of the lighter, more concentrated, and more gratifying film it is. Ridley and Holland give terrific, unadorned portrayals as characters we feel about, in a setting that's been developed just enough to make you concentrate on the fascinating, unresolved mysteries that the film will never do more than skim over. The male dominance cult that has been built up and nurtured is one of the most nurtured components of this movie. However, once you're engaged, it's a tremendous experience that stays with you after the film's initial charm has faded. Makes you think, how can anyone survive even an hour in this world without going insane? Antlers. The film Antlers is about melancholy, the darkness of humanity, darkness that is supernatural, movie making darkness in the literal sense. It's a filthy, nasty, violent film that always combines well together, and it clearly feels like the product of its creator's passions, notably director Scott Cooper's. It focuses on people on the periphery of society who are carrying a significant emotional burden. It imagines a world where genuine suffering might lead to unspeakable catastrophe. Trauma, sorrow, abuse, and addiction aren't new themes in this genre, and those quick to dismiss the elevated horror trend will find enough to critique here, but they'll also be dismissing the film's remarkable workmanship, dedicated ensemble, and noteworthy ambition. Antlers definitely lives up to its expectation, and it has the potential to gain a following over time. The story takes place in a small township in Oregon, one of those previously blue-collar towns that has been decimated by economic downturns and drug addiction. Paul Meadows, played by Jesse Plemons, is the reluctant sheriff of this remote corner of the globe. Julia, played by Carrie Russell, Paul's sister, has come home to a town that has previously caused her anguish from her childhood and now appears to be the most desolate location on the planet. If Antlers has a flaw, it's how much the writing seems willing to focus on the issues rather than the persons involved. Besides that, this is a beautifully executed film that ends up gripping you in ways you never expected it to. Supporting roles played by brilliant performers such as Amy Madigan and Graham Greene feel especially developed. Russell and Plemons put in a lot of effort to make their parts feel more multifaceted. It's also a film that, due to its extremely serious tone, can become very thought-provoking. Those expecting a classic monster film based on the dramatic trailers that have been airing since before the pandemic began may be underwhelmed by what amounts to a character drama. 
At the same time, Cooper's own commitment to the subject and its inevitably amazing outcomes necessitates certain bold, often frightening filmmaking choices which he predictably embraces. Antlers is a lovely, thorough, and yet unduly somber entry in a horror subgenre that is explored far too rarely these days. Guillermo del Toro was certainly correct in casting Cooper, and the movie uses del Toro's own energy correctly to fully bring it to life. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.